what I'm going to end up doing is something like that for a painted turtle. Because in these pictures that I'm looking at online, it looks like a painted turtle has similar back scale patterns. So the uh, limbs, of course, aren't as quite as long and stretchy since painted turtles like to waddle around on land sometimes or sit up on their rocks. Hello, kitten. While sea turtles like to go swimming in the ocean. So the limbs will be a little different, but the rest of the body shape will be fairly similar. All right, so I'm going to do this with watercolors, and I'll do a first one as a crayon resist to show you how the crayon resist technique works. If you want to paint along with me, that is fine. If you want to draw or paint something else, that's fine. And if you want to just hang out and chat, that is fine. All right, so we're going to start with a painted turtle. And we're going to do a crayon resist. I wonder if I have any bigger paper. that whole thing. There we go. Let's push this a little further. Alright, so if you want to paint along with watercolors with me, you can do that. If you want to do something else completely different, you can do that too. And you can just chat. Let me know how you're doing today your plans are for the weekend and so on so crayon resist when you do a crayon resist here's what the concept behind it is watercolors work because you get the paint wet and then you put it down on the paper and as the paint dries it soaks into the paper a little so you can't just brush it off it's actually stuck into the paper so the paint has to get to the paper for it to stick. Crayons are wax and when you draw with crayon you make a layer of wax between the paint and the paper so the paint can no longer get to the paper. So if I drew crayon around these white lines the paint would not be able to get to the paper in those spots and it would leave white lines or whatever color of crayon you decided to work with. White works well because the paper is generally white and that way the crayon tends to blend in with the paper so that you can't see where the crayon is and where the paper is. So it's a fun way of making designs and I really like the rough edges that the crayon will leave to give it sort of a fractally loose feel to it. So this is just one of a number of different styles of artwork that you can try. Here comes one of my cats. This is Felix. It's going to take a drink of my watercolor water while it is nice and clean and fresh. So we will let, since this is about animals today, we will let Felix take a drink of water because that's just part of what he likes to do. Are you not drinking? Or are you just taking a little drink? Hello, thank you for visiting us, Felix. That was very kind of you. Now you can go into the window. All right, so. A good first step when do working with a lot of art is to draw your image with pencil because that way you can refine your image and try things and erase things and so on before you make any permanent marks. When you are drawing with pencil, it's good to have a sharp pencil. So I have a pencil eraser. So I got a pencil, that's fairly sharp. And in general, don't try to use the erasers that come with the pencil. For some reason, they are all pretty awful. <laughs> I don't know why they even put these things on the end of a pencil if they're not even going to give you a functional eraser. I think that these things are just plastic circles <laughs> that they put on there for decoration. So it's good to have 
an actual eraser so you can erase the lines that you don't want to do. All right, so we're going to draw a turtle. So a turtle is pretty much an oval. We have this turtle swimming, so it's sort of at an angle. It's nice to put a little bit of movement in your animals if you can. It engages the reader or the, the viewer a little more than if it's just a stationary animal sitting. We like to see things in motion in general, but it depends on the kind of animal you're drawing and what they're doing. If you're drawing a lion lounging in the sun, they're probably going to be pretty stationary. So it's all up to the scene you want to set. But this one is swimming in the water, so we want to give it a little sense of motion. So we'll give it oval. I used to draw a lot of these turtles. Let's see. <laughs> I used to draw a lot of these turtles, and I haven't drawn a turtle for a while, so it might take me a couple of times, but that's all right. Get the sense that I want to go for. I want a round. It's funny how when you do something a lot of times, it becomes second nature, and then you try to go back and do it again, and suddenly you have to re-remember how you used to do things. Well, I think that's more the general shape that I want to aim for. Alright, so he's got a little neck color. And he's got an oval head. Alright, painted turtles, as compared with sea turtles, have shorter legs because they need to be able to use them to climb up onto logs and rocks and stuff and sun them. We have a lot of painted turtles around here in Massachusetts, and I like them immensely. I love to kayak, so I really enjoy going out and kayaking and watching the little turtles. So let's see, I'm looking for a good picture that shows how their little legs and feet are laid out, so I get it reasonably proportioned. They are just so cute. And they like to clump in little groups on their rocks and logs. Alright, I can't seem to find any pictures at the angle that I want with their legs out, but we will just Make it general. They seem to have four little toes. But they aren't long and swoopy like that. And we're just doing a rough idea here anyway. It's not like we are doing a super realistic version, we are doing a fairly abstract version. Alright. Then the back one sort of splay out. All right. Again, we're going to be tracing over this with crayon, so the idea is not that we're trying to be super accurate, but we want to be generally <laughs> realistic. So again, that's a sea turtle. This is a painted turtle, which is a turtle that hangs out in lakes and rivers and things like that. All right, so now we get to the back pattern, which is fairly similar to that turtle. So I think they should be a little rounder. See, I'm not going to get picky about 
but I might as well fix it while I'm here. I think the rounder and not as long. We'll end it right here. Right, hold, on. hold on, we're gonna fix his back end. more of the shape I'm aiming for. So again, this is why you do stuff in pencil. You draw something in, you look at it, you say, all right, what would I want to change about that? Because right now it's all very easy to change. Just erase, make a little adjustment. That's more of what I'm thinking about for a painted turtle. And more of a shoulder up here. And again, we're going to be doing this in crayon, so precise lines are not going to matter. But it's good to have the rough shape that you're interested in. Closer. And more. There we go. again. Get on one little foot. And two little feet. A little wider. All right. Back pattern. Back pattern is really close to that one. So he's got a fringe around the edge and then he's got the center big sections. So we'll start with the fringe around the edge, which with the painted turtle goes right up around this neck area. So we'll start with that. And again, this is your turtle. You don't have to draw these sections exactly the way that I draw them. I'm trying to figure out if these top areas go up and down, but in all the pictures I'm looking at, they seem to go pretty much in a straight line. The bottoms have little bows to them, but we'll fix that when we do the crayon part of this. We're just making rough guidelines here. Now he's got his edge ridges. And now we we'll give him the ridge here. Which we'll put on those two. And then these guys sort of do the same looping thing. Again, these can be fairly rough. We're giving the sense of a turtle.
sort of trying to do this at an angle so that you guys can see what I'm up to, so that adds to the challenge, but that's all right. These come out of the side sections. Where do they come out? Yeah, they come out of the middle sections. So we have a rough idea of a turtle and its different sections. So again, this is a painted turtle, not a sea turtle, but we are using the sea turtle as a model. Now the first step when you're doing a crayon resist is to draw it out with pencil and it's fine to take your time and to use an eraser to erase the parts that you're working on. And the more that you work on things like this, the more they come out the way that you were intending to. So now that we have the pencil stage done, we are going to move on to the crayon stage. And I also note that I drew this sort of dark so that you could see it on the camera. You might draw it lighter if you were doing this yourself because that way you don't see the pencil as much when you do the watercolor stage. But it's okay to see pencil when you're doing watercolors because most watercolorists start with a pencil drawing and it's a normal part of a watercolor image. Even if you go into a museum and look at famous watercolors, you can often see the pencil guidelines they use to get themselves started. All right, so next up we have a crayon. Now you can make it super sharp so that you can really draw the lines where you want to. But I tend to like the crayons to be sort of not sharp. I guess you could call that dull, but it's not quite dull either. But anyway, not pointy, because I like the wiggly lines that the white leaves around the edges when it's done with a rough crayon. So now what we're going to do is we're going to, this is sort of hard to do at this angle, but I will make it work. I'm going to trace over our pencil line with the crayon. And because we're doing this, and because a crayon is fairly uh, thick, we can't have a lot of little spaces in here. My cat's jumping all over the place. I know, sweetie. You like to jump. All right. So we're going to trace over all these lines. And this causes the resist part of this process. Everywhere we put this crayon line, which is in essence a wax line, the paint will not be able to get down to the paper because it's being blocked, being resisted by this crayon. And that will leave white in those areas, the white of the paper. And I suppose the white of the crayon, since the crayon is putting down white wax and it will stand out in contrast to the areas that are painted. It will also mean, if you are a new artist, that you don't have to worry as much about painting near those lines because the paint can't go in that space, even if you try to. It's going to be blocked by the wax, so that makes it easier to maintain the lines between areas. Part of the challenge of doing these is keeping track of where you have drawn with the crayon and where you have not, because it is white and it's easy to miss an area. The crayon tends to be sort of shiny, so when do I get done with what I think is everything, I can hold the paper at an angle and look for the shiny areas. That'll help tell me 
if I've gotten every line or not. If you miss a line, it means when you're doing your painting, if you paint an area and think, oh, there's going to be a white line there because of the crayon, <laughs> it could be that there isn't one because you forgot to put the crayon there. All right, little foot one, little foot two, These toes are not going to be quite as I drew them because this crayon is fairly thick and those lines were fairly thin. But again, that is all right. I'm going to erase his little paws over here though because I stretched that out a bit more with the crayon. All right, so now I hold this at an angle and I look for shininess. And it looks like I have indeed drawn over pencil with crayon in every spot. All right, so the step two of the crayon resist project. Is to trace over all of your pencil that you want to have the resist happen with a crayon, usually a white crayon. And you can type if you have any questions. I am happy to answer questions. If you're watching this in its replay, you can contact the BVAA with any questions. You can post them on our Facebook page or YouTube page or so on, and we are happy to answer them. All right, so now we have a pencil drawing, which we have traced over with white crayon. And now we want to get to the painting stage. So there's a particular style of painting that I did here on the original sea turtle and that is wet and wet. Now if I took a brush, so I have a pile of brushes over here, so I use, well that one's sort of crunchy, use this one. So a lot of these are very inexpensive brushes from Michaels. Artist Loft is the Michaels brand and this is a Artist Loft 5. I'll just buy the whole batches of sets of brushes in different sizes. And that way you can grab whichever one is interesting to me to fit in the spot. So if I were to get this brush wet, stick it in some paint, and then paint in the color, then that spot I painted would be just that one solid color, which is a pretty effect and that can be worked work for a lot of times but you can see here that the colors all sort of run together and I like that effect that happens if you make the paper wet first and then drop the color in so the color can just spread wherever it wants to go so we will show you how this works so the first step is that I'm going to get the brush wet and I am going to get all of these different spots wet with no paint color at all so I'll get the brush wet there's no paint on here and I'm just painting with water. So all I'm doing is putting water into these sections. Now when you do this, <laughs> you have to work pretty quickly. Oh, and here comes the cat. All right, well, all right, I'll go slowly then because <laughs> we may have to redo this again once the cat leaves. Yep, you can drink now. Right now it is nice and clean. There is no paint in there yet. You're gonna step with your little feet right on the turtle. Yes, that's what the kitty does. All right, now we got wet kitty footprints. You having fun, kitty? Here, I'll move this out of your way. You are a very good kitten. All right, kitten is hunkering down on my mouse pad, which is a good thing. All right, so back to what we're doing. <laughs> So we're taking a clean brush, we're putting it in the water, and we are just putting water down on our painting where we are going to want paints to be. Now it's fairly dry in my house right now, so this is going to dry quickly. So 
I want to put down a fair amount of water so that I have half a chance of painting it before it dries again. So I'm putting a fair amount of water over the entire painting area. And you can't really see it because water is clear and you're just seeing the white paper. But maybe you can see a little bit of the glisten from the water. All right, once I get it painted, I will hold it up to see if you can see where it's glistening, where the water is laid down. But when you're doing this sort of thing, if you're somewhere where it's drying quickly, you want to go pretty quickly so that it doesn't dry before you go to the paint section. So it's not something that you could do and then go off and have a sandwich and then come back and keep working on. You want to get this part all done in one fell swoop. All right, so I don't know if you can see the shiny area where I have painted in wet. Oops, I missed a leg. Part of the benefit of holding it up and looking around. Go back and make sure I get some sections that need to be drying before I finish. All right, so now if I dip this in a blue and start touching areas, you can see how it spreads out. It will spread and do this very naturally, which gives it a lovely gentle feel to it. Now I realize that, that painted turtles don't actually have bright blues and greens, but I like to <laughs> add a little bit of fun and whimsy to my paintings, as you've probably noticed if you look at them. Alright, so we add some blue in here, and then we add some green. And you could do whatever colors you want to in your turtle. If you want to make a orange version of a painted turtle or a purple version of a painted turtle, it is completely up to you. Your turtle is your own creation. And that's part of the fun of our world. Being able to explore and do things that make you happy. So see how the color is stretching? The water is drying while you're doing this. So you want to work reasonably quickly while the water is still in its wet phase. You can also add little designs if you want to. Now they aren't going to be incredibly accurate because the water is flowing, excuse me, and moving where it wants to. So it's not like in this stage you can draw letters or numbers or something like that on the turtle and have them be very legible. But you can draw general ideas of shapes. All right, so let's put some blue blue in here. Now something else to think about is that the human eye uses patterns of dark and light to figure out how the three dimensions are laid out. So it's good if you're trying to give sort of a three-dimensional shape to your drawing that you're doing, to think about where the light is coming from and which areas would be lighter and which would be darker. Now with watercolors, everything dries lighter than what you see initially. So the colors that you see right now are not the exact colors that will be on the finished painting because all of this will 
lighten as it dries. So you want to keep that in mind and put things on a little darker than you intend for their final version to be. And also, if we think that the light is, for example, coming from this corner into this little swimming turtle's world, then things up over here would be lighter because the sun was shining on them more, and things over here would be in the shadow. So as we're sitting here developing our turtle shape, we would come back over to this left hand area and we would put in deeper colors to show that this was the shadowed area. And also, this happens to be, um, we're doing this quick because we're doing a video here. What you want to think about if you're doing a more serious watercolor is see how there's a ridge down in here? The paper is buckling a little because of the water and the paper actually has a swoop in it and the water is falling down into that ridge and gathering. So something if you do a lot of watercolors that you can start to think about is taping the paper down flat before you begin so that everything lays flat or also to pre-wet the area and let it dry and let it go through some of that buckling process before you begin so that it doesn't buckle when you're actually painting. And also I put on a ton of water on here because I wanted to make sure that it stayed wet because I'm sitting here talking to you and doing other things which um, I normally wouldn't be doing if I was just watercoloring on my own. So that gave, having all that extra water in there gave it the extra water to be able to uh, buckle like that. So it doesn't normally buckle quite this much, but still just some different things to think about. All right, so we are talking about shadows. On the shadows of an object, it would tend to be lighter where the sun is shining and darker on the backside. So you can put in more layers of color to give it that darker sense. You can put in color that has a darker aspect to it. So you can use a color that has less water in it so that it is denser. You can mix in a little bit of the opposite color. So you can, if it's blue, you can add in a little orange to make it more of a gray to give it that kind of shadowy effect. So there's a number of different things that you can do if you want to be able to cause that effect. And also, this shell is curved. So when something is curved, the light tends to glint off of the top part of the curve and even the front side will have a little bit of shadow in it because of the way the curve works. So there's a number of different things you can do. Put this back area down here. All right here I'll show you another technique. Let me figure out where I put my paper towels. Hold on a second. All right. Watercolors are wet, and because of that, paper towels can be used to suck them up. So if we wanted a light stripe down the middle, we can just use paper towels and gently dab at it, and it will pull up the watercolor and some of the pigment See that? The stripe down the middle. And that can then be the glint of the sun off of the spine, we'll call it. It's not an actual spine, but the top center of the shell area. All right, so that's something else you can do. Watercolor will still stain that area. It's still a little blue. But you can see that now that's a lighter stripe, which sort of represents where the shell is curving over like that. All right, is there anything else I want to do? No, 
a little more green down. So just like with the shell, the left side of the head would be a little darker. See, it's not spreading as much now because the paper is drying. So the left side of his little paw would be a little darker. Left side of his back paw. Watercolor is often about the idea of layers. That you let the first layer dry, then you add a second layer and a third layer. That is all great for when you're doing dry paintings of watercolors. But this initial layer with it all wet and wet, once we get this down, it will be sort of hard to keep editing that color. Because once it dries, we won't be able to do the same sort of drop it in and have it spread kind of stuff. We want to get anything that we want this wet and wet technique to be part of now while it is wet. <laughs> so I'm just adding some little details to the shadow side of some of these shapes. And again, you can see that it's drying lighter than it was initially, That's part of the way watercolors work. I mentioned that I tend to, in general, buy inexpensive watercolors to keep a budget. It's worth noting that inexpensive waters, watercolors tend to have lower amounts of pigment in them, so then you have to do multiple layers to create the same effect that you might have just needed one pass with with a more expensive watercolor that had more pigment in it. So there's always a trade-off in everything, but you go with what your budget can withstand so that watercoloring is stress-free and relaxing. Alright, so you can see in some areas the resist is holding out strong and in some areas I did not pressed down heavily with the crayon and so things are merging together a little and that's all right. With watercolors you sort of learn to accept what it does because it's a fluid kind of painting system. You can be super precise with watercolors if you keep everything dry you keep the brush fairly dry and you put the paint exactly where you want it to. But to me, if I was going to do that, then I might as well work with acrylics or oils or something else like that. I like the loose, flowy aspect of watercolors. And I also love the glowy stained glass feel to it. And that happens because with watercolors, you can see through the paint to the paper. So like with acrylic, it's making an actual solid block of color that you can't see the paper underneath, but with watercolors, you're, the light is going through, bouncing off the paper, and coming back at you. So it's almost as if it's backlit, because you're seeing the reflection of the light off that white paper. You can want a little more green in some of these blue areas over here. So solid blue. All right. I think we've learned a number of techniques in here. We learned about drawing with a pencil first so that you can erase it and make your changes. We learned about crayon resist where you trace over the artwork with a crayon on the edges to help form those white areas. 
I learned about using paper towels to bring things off, and I suppose I'll also mention if you get the brush clean and then dry, that if you then come on here with a clean dry brush, it'll suck up a little of the paint and water, and you can use it sort of like a little vacuum. So if you put down too much paint somewhere and want to pull it out, then you can do that. Alright, so if anyone have any questions, let me know. But those are the basics of the technique for doing a watercolor crayon resist with our little abstract painted turtle. Alright. Alright. Painted turtle crayon resist.